Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the third of our four-part webinar series on the prepared practice, expert advice on readying your office to reopen. My name is Pete Cerrone from Darby Dental Supply and I'm also joined by my colleague Jeff Daly and Jim Gerson from CareStack who will be moderating today's session. Today's session, Managing Cash Flow and Supply Chains as Your Practice Reopens, will be hosted by Mike White, Eddie Garrity from Clifton Warson Allen, and Dan Traub from Method USA. You can view our first two sessions or register for next week's by going to darbydental.com and clicking the link on the homepage. And before we get started, I'd like to note that as an attendee, you're automatically set to mute. We encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll aim to answer as many questions as possible uh, by the end of the session. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Jeff Daly from Darby Dental Supply. Sure, thanks so much, Pete. So we're excited for the third installment in our webinar series. Uh, we're excited to be here again with our partner CareStack and with Mike and Eddie from CLA and Dan Trout from Method. Uh, I think today we're gonna present some really useful information on helping practices create strategies to conserve cash uh, in what might be the tightest part of the cash crunch as they start to come back online and see that gap between when procedures are performed and when reimbursement is received. Um, so a little bit about Darby on our shameless plug of the day. What you may already know about Darby is that we partner with our customers to help keep their dental supply costs down. Over the past 10 years or so, we've built a suite of solutions that help our customers resolve the challenges that they tell us they face on a daily basis. Today, those services include IT services, equipment service for the mechanical equipment in office, and a, a myriad of others. Uh, and finally, and maybe the most salient given the times, just a reminder that for our entire 70-year history, all of our account managers have worked completely remotely with our customers. So no extra bodies walking into your practice, and we're happy to be able to say that our full team is here. Um, they're set up in the safety and comfort of their home. So we're 100% functional, ready to help practices in any way that we can. If you're interested in learning more how we might be able to help you practice, please feel free to reach out to one of our account managers. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to my counterpart, Jim Gerson from CareStack. Jeff, thank you for the introduction and good morning to many of you and good afternoon to others as well. So unlike Darby Dental, CareStack is probably not a brand name. Uh, what's important for you to know about CareStack, and I represent CareStack obviously, is that we're 100% cloud-based system for the management of the dental practice. And we typically work with two types of clients. First, the, it's the, pra the practice that's growing, that's enjoying success, but sees some challenges as they, re as they reopen their practices in terms of offering a touchless or contactless experience with their, for their patients. And they see technology as helping them overcome that challenge. They just don't know how to get there. The second type of client we work with, while they're ambitious and visionary, they've grown frustrated and aggravated by managing many different subscriptions to run their dental practice. As you can see from up here, that might be scheduling, charting, patient reminders, an integrated chat feature, online forms. The list goes on and on, and these subscriptions have choked these practices, and they've grown really frustrated to produce a lot of sleepless nights for the, for the leadership. So I'll pause here and say, if you fall into one of these two buckets, please take a look at CareStack. Go to our website, carestack.com, and request a demo. So that's it for the commercials today. I'm gonna to turn it over to Mike White, who's gonna be our leader here. And please, we want this to be an interactive discussion. And so I encourage you to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom panel, and we'll do the best we can to answer all your questions along the way. So Mike, take it away, please. Yeah, and actually we're gonna quickly introduce Dan, who's, who's joining us today. Dan, do you oh, want my to apologies. About Method? Yeah, that was a no stumble. Worries. Dan, uh, that's okay. Dan, you want to introduce Method and, and you guys, and then we'll go from there. Yes, yes, my pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, so Method may be a, a new brand for many of you as well. Method Procurement is a specialized provider of procurement software for the dental industry. And we, uh, we have a number of components to that, including inventory management, sourcing, the purchasing process, the payables process, and today we'll share some of those, uh, the expertise that we've, uh, we've built in serving the dental industry. Uh, my background is as both a consultant as well as a procurement practitioner for the last 25 years, a little over 25 years, I've specialized in procurement technology. And I come from a higher education background where the procurement function uh, is very high volume and uh, comes with some unique challenges that are not that uh, different really from some of the volumes that we see 
from a busy dental practice. So I'm excited to uh, to be here, and we'll we'll speak with you in a few minutes. Excellent, and I, I, I got the pleasure to meet with Dan this week and learn his wife is also in our profession, so he gets to live vicariously through us uh, at those times. But I'm excited to be here again today with my partner Eddie. Um, I'll let Eddie introduce himself first, and then we'll kind of circle back to uh, getting started. Eddie. Hey, yeah, I'm Eddie Garrity. Um, thanks very much, Mike, and uh, thanks to guys from Kerastack and Derby for um, hosting this again. Um, my name is Eddie Garrity. I'm a principal with Harrison Allen CLA. Um, I work mainly in the CFO outsourcing the biz ops department with a touch of tax strategy as well and tax advisory. Um, work quite a lot with dental groups with Mike, uh, be it from uh, larger DSOs through to small uh, one practice, one office practices as well. So looking forward to our discussion again today. Yeah, and, and thank you. My name is Mike White. Uh, I've been partners with Eddie for almost eight years now, on nine. Uh, been a wonderful time where we've been focused on the dental uh, from single location to multi-site, as you mentioned, uh, from everything from tax accounting and advisory services. We merged our firm in with CLA. Uh, almost going on two years now and, and been excited to be part of that. Uh, CLA is a national firm uh, representing 7,500 doctors nationwide and half of those being the dentistry industry. Um, so excited to be part of this conversation and continue this education series. So <clears throat> today in our third part of our four part series, if you will, um, we are going to be chatting a little bit about the reopening and cash flow. I know last time when we met on Wednesday, we ran out of time. There were a lot of questions towards the end. We will, and, and Dan is, is the same as Eddie and I, we will work through questions as the presentation goes on. So we want, you know, there will be some Q&A sessions towards the end, but we also want to field questions that are relevant to the slides as we go through them. Uh, Eddie and I will kick off the presentation um, and chat through these topics on my left. Uh, recap of where we are now. Uh, we won't spend as much time there, but I think it's important so we can spend a little bit more time on that recapture conversation. What should we be doing? What's the new urgency of preparing your team and working through that process? Uh, and then making sure we, we, again, go through detailed steps of each one of those pieces to the conversation. Um, you know, supplies is a big conversation today, which Dan's going to give us a lot of great insights. So we'll be merging the conversations there, and you'll be open to questions even during our session. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll get started here in the conversation of what we're doing and a little recap of where we are now. Um, when we chatted on Wednesday, we talked a lot about PPP loans and idle loans, and, and Eddie and I, knowing we didn't get a whole lot of time to uh, answer, we got a lot of time, we didn't get a chance to answer all the questions that came through Wednesday. Uh, we did want to touch on PPP one more time, at least idle process, because really the focus now isn't so much on receiving the funds or getting the funds, although I know a few of you out there are still applying for those. Um, my understanding, at least from the banking sources that I have, is most of that has been tapped particularly on the PPP side. Uh, the idle loan, I'm actually starting to see renewed energy or renewed application processing. I actually saw two yesterday from clients um, that they got their uh, money. One of them got money and the other one got a notice saying that they're starting a process now. So we're starting to see a little bit of activity there, but relative to the PPP loan, uh, now is the conversation about the forgiveness. And where Eddie, ourselves, and our, our team are spending a lot of time right now is making sure we maximize that effort of forgiveness relative to the PPP loan, because that is supposed to be one of the benefits. Certainly, there's been some guidance this week on uh, what that looks like, and I'm sure there will still be guidance on what that looks like here in the weeks to come. Um, but when we're looking at the forgiveness, it's now a tracking exercise. And I know, Eddie, you and I chatted about this a little bit. Do you want to talk about the tracking of what we should be doing right now? Yeah, what we've been what we've been talking to clients about is um, once they get the funds to place it in a separate bank account. And what I've been saying to clients is, go through your calculation every be it if you're doing weekly or biweekly payroll, calculate out how much of that payroll is forgivable. So, and the big things there is obviously this uh, fifteen, you know this. Uh, 100,000 annualized salary, so you're allowed to give up to 15,834 or some, something like that to each employee over that eight week period. So, again, calculating and, and what I would say is then re reimburse your operating account or payroll clearing account for that amount 
also with your rent or be it mortgage interest as the case may be if it, your building is owned plus your utilities so kind of have that track of transactions almost reimbursements to your other accounts and hopefully then once the forgiveness uh, application process opens up it's as simple as printing out a bank statement and having your different schedules backing that up and giving it to the bank manager obviously they'll have an application form and uh, hopefully it'll be easy from there uh, right now there still is no uh, formal forgiveness guidance we're all waiting with bated breath on that and I, I know some of the questions that we got the last day we can answer basically using assumptions but no more than that and the banks are no different at this point because we just don't have that guidance and uh, a lot of the guidance that's come out over the last four to six weeks has kind of started you know they've kind of slip slided a little bit on certain elements of it and even to the point whereby um congress some of the congress guys are going back and against the irs on one of the issues of taxability because they don't believe that was in the spirit of what they enacted so there's a lot going on um but like i said that forgiveness guidance is going to be uh, key as to uh, some of the gray areas around this but in general tracking it that's that's what i've been telling clients um you know there's not a lot more you can do at this point and i think it's important for us all just as a friendly reminder that the goal of the tpp loan was was truly in the spirit of bringing employees back and getting the unemployment rates down you know as we saw another three million unemployed last week uh we know it's probably keeping that number down further than where it would have been but you know, we're having a lot of conversations with folks saying, great, this is free money now. You know, I don't want to bring my employees back because I'm not open yet. Um, and that isn't in the spirit of what the intention was and all that. But what is in the spirit is in greater conversation is cash flow preservation. So as we build off of, you know, those points that Eddie, Eddie was mentioning on the PPP forgiveness, you know, it's not only just trying to figure out what is the PPP forgiveness that look like and how do I maximize the free money, quote unquote, that we hear so often. Uh, but it's also about making sure we can open our doors again. You know, what does this look like? What is our schedule going to look like? Who's, who's our team? Are they all going to come back? Um, am I going to have the money to reopen them? Do I need to be spending money on marketing? All of these conversations have got to be swimming through each one of your heads uh, on a day-to-day -day basis because I know the amount of conversations I'm having day-to-day -day about each one of those topics. So when we look at where are we now, um, you know, many states are preparing for reopening, and in some states, like where we are in Texas, Eddie and I are in Texas, uh, are open and are working through that. And many more states are opening in the next week or two to come, and we're starting to see schedules fill up and patients coming back, and, and certainly we're also starting to see new protocols. Uh, you know, if I speak to experience from not only what the, the clients we serve, but also from the personal dentistry I go to, um, you know, getting that letter from our dentist about what we're going to do and how this is going to be different than it was in the past. Um, and I'm sure each one of you are thinking about that. So we'll chat a bit about that as we talk through strategic decisions and stuff. But, you know, patients and key members, and this is going to be a conversation and one that Dan, Eddie, and I had the other day, is communication. Um, for all of us here on, on this call today, all of us that you've gotten to meet so far, we're all service providers. We're all here to help you in the dentistry industry. Um, and we want to hear from our clients. We're trying to not only put sessions and presentations on like this from an educational standpoint to be beneficial, uh, but we're also helping our individual customers through that process. But beyond the outside vendors, it's also your team. I can't tell you how often I'm having conversations with doctors that through this whole pandemic still haven't spoken to their team, uh, haven't spoken to their associates, haven't spoken to their doctors, haven't spoken to their providers. Like, well, I don't know what to say. And I understand that sentiment, but you have to say something because they're looking to you as that fearless leader. They're looking to you as that guidance. And they just want to understand where are you right now? And they understand things are fluid and from a change in standpoint. So, but let's talk about planning. You know, I put this visualization up. Our firm did a really good job, um, and I guess our shame would plug, if you will, but it did a really good job of building this COVID planning tool. They built it around actually the firm's budget tool that we use internally to manage our $1 billion firm. Uh, but they built this around recapturing. What does this look like in, in a recapture? We know what our baseline is. So if I just, you know, make some screens and swoops on the, the screen here, um, we know we have a dip. We either went to zero, we went, maybe went to 10 to 20% of where we were before. What we don't know, and we know when that happened, we know the day we closed. Maybe what we don't know, or we do know by this point, is when we're going to reopen. And when we reopen, what does that schedule look like? So 
from a visualization standpoint, I thought this was such a great visual that we utilized to say, okay, how long is this search going to be? Some people are six weeks, some are eight. Some may go as long as eight or nine, maybe 10 weeks um, from a planning standpoint. But what we don't know is on the tail end of that, what is the recapture? You know, we had eight weeks, we're going to choose that number, eight weeks of pent up demand, patient demand of patients that couldn't come in, maybe cases that were presented and treatment accepted, but we couldn't get a schedule. Um, you know, what does that look like in trying to get them back in on top of our normal repair and hygiene patient? In addition, are those same patients going to have insurance? Are they going to have funds to accept treatment now? Are they part of the 30 million people unemployed right now who may have lost their job uh, or certainly got furloughed or scaled back to their jobs to where they don't have that disposable income? So when we start thinking through that plan, and this isn't to scare you, it's certainly to get you thinking, though, um, but when we think of that recapture, we're having these conversations, and we'll do this a little bit further here in a minute, of, all right, what are we going to do with our schedule? You know, are we opening up our schedule some more? Are we going to expand our hours, expand our days? Uh, are we going to staff and double staff to where we're splitting the staff because maybe we're expanding our hours, but because of our state guidance or our local city guidance, we can't open to, to more than one patient per hour or more, one, more than two or three patients per operatory or whatever that may be for you respectfully to manage your normal flow. Maybe you're a seven operatory practice, normally keep them all full, but now you can only have three of them full. What does that look like? So, you know, the other side of that is, and we're following some of our, you know, Asian countries and European countries that are opening before us to see what's happening in the industry there. And we're starting to see there was pent up demand, and then it fell off a little bit on the tail end of that. So we look at this recapture firm to see what is our new normal. You know, maybe we don't get to see the 100% of the utilization that we saw in 2019. Maybe it's just 90%, maybe it's 95%. What adjustments as practice owners and practitioners do we need to have in our practice to adapt to those changes. And certainly everything we're seeing here is speculative because we don't know, but we need to plan accordingly. So when we start thinking about preparing to reopen, in this list, I could write the entire rest of the presentation just on the things that you need to do. Um, what we've been saying so often is start a list. It can be so overwhelming. I'm sure you're having sleepless nights. I'm sure you're having these conversations with your spouse, your office manager, maybe your business partner. What do I do? What's the next steps? What, you know, you need to make a list. We are certainly, if you're a million dollar practice, $500,000 practice, $20 million practice group, you know, every one of those scenarios brings in a different level of um, things that you need to accomplish and things that you need to work through. But I wanted to at least have a starting list. When I'm starting to think about preparing to reopen, what I need to, re we, what I need to evaluate, uh, we do need to look at our schedule. You know, one of the things that I spoke to early on, and of course now we have a bit more clarity on when we're opening, was using your state's guidance of whether it's May 8th, May 18th, June 1st, that needs to be the day we're rushing toward. We have guidance, we understand it may change, but back to my communication point, um, we need to communicate to our patient base, what are we doing? Um, and this is the date we're charging towards, and this is what we're going to do to make sure you're safe. Um, that means working with, you know, your procurement process and making sure you're having PPE in place, making sure you're working with your team who does your scheduling to fill the schedule for those days, and then give them some parameters. So let's say they, they were to schedule full like they normally would for two weeks, but they're still seeing this demand from patients come back. We'll give them those parameters and say, great, we can open an hour a day. Once you fill two weeks, then go back and open an hour, fill that up. Go back and open another hour. Maybe go back and open that sixth day of the week um, and really work through that process and give them those guidelines of how you want the schedule to be filled up. And then, of course, as we're doing that guidelines, make sure they understand the communication of how the patient flow is going to go. You know, when we talk about expanding hours and days, um, is that every day of the week? Maybe you're a four-and-a-half-day schedule. Maybe you're a four-day schedule. Now you're willing to go to six for a short period of time, but at least go there. Uh, to recapture some of that pent up demand, get your team back to work, um, some of those lost wages, some of the lost revenue. But what are we doing and how who is responsible and ultimately accountable to filling that schedule? And accountability is the key that we'll talk through uh, the rest of the presentation. I'm sure Dan will touch on it as well. What are those measures for social distancing we're taking? When we look at this process, um, you know, sterilization between patients, additional PPE that we need to change out of our, our garments a little more frequently, uh, maybe we aren't wearing uh, normal clothes. We're wearing, everybody's wearing scrubs now. Everybody's wearing, again, every practice is a little different. I've seen it all. 
but what are we doing and how are we communicating this to our patients, our team? You know, when we're filling that schedule, that is a good time to have those conversations with our patients. Um, this is what- Yeah, Mike, for example, what does the waiting room look like, yeah. right? Yeah. Is there a waiting room or is it virtual? Is it on the curb outside? Well put. Yeah, it is. Uh, could I, could our, I just- our Yeah. Yeah, so just add in there, Mike, it's a very good point. Um, one of the other things is how has all of this um, additional PPE and procedures, how is that affecting the amount of time you spend on each procedure? Uh, what we've heard in the last few days, obviously since the Open to Texas, I've heard uh, from one dentist that she reckoned that each procedure is taking her up to uh, twice the amount of time than it was without all the additional PPE. Obviously it's all necessary, but it's suddenly your schedule is suddenly, it's, it's a scheduling issue now because each thing takes more time. So again, and as Mike said, every practice is going to be different depending on what you do, depending on your skill set, depending on what you did before, I guess, you know, so. Uh, and there's going to be a learning curve. I'd say some of the answers last Monday are going to be different next Monday when you've kind of looked at the previous week. No, both both great points. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And and this, it leads to one of the last bullet points is we need to build a fluid budget. You know, one of the things Eddie and I have noticed over the years, and certainly built a business model around it, is we believe this part. You know, of course, we're CPAs. We believe you know the core functionality that's got to be captured at all times is, is accounting. And in all the years that I've been dentistry, and all the years I've been working with small business owners. Um, you know, I'm looking at about 30 new practices a month, and I, on average, they're three months behind in their financials. And with three-month-old data, you can't make real-time decisions. So utilize this downtime. When you're making that list, it, maybe it's in the top five, maybe it's not number one, but certainly in the top five, get your financials caught up. Get them caught up and get a system with your accountant, your bookkeeper, your CPA to keep them up to date regularly. <laughs> If we open back up and we're on a reduced schedule and we were planning for a percent schedule full, what adopt, what changes do we need to make to our cash flow, our, our staffing, our costs um, in order to do that? And to build on the PPE, you know, are there going to be additional costs coming into maybe not on a per unit basis, but maybe on the number of units? Um, you know, those are things we have to take in consideration uh, relative to, again, planning accordingly and cash flow management, cash flow preservation. One of the things we chatted about last time, and I'll, I'll touch on it again today, uh, was those conversations. Again, at this point, I'm assuming most of them have been had, but have we spoken to our landlord? Have we spoken to our, you know, our lenders? Um, did we put our, pay, you know, our employees on furlough? What have we done in order to make sure we preserve cash? And again, back to the communication side, don't just assume people know what's going on. And when you don't pay their bill, they're going to be fine with it because they know. Um, have a conversation, you know, make sure you set up that relationship and have a stronger relationship. You know, I, you know, I can't speak on behalf of Darby and Kirstak, but I'm sure they're thinking the same, and I'm sure Dan and Method is as well, but Eddie and I are certainly bending over backwards with those clients that I know they can't afford me right now, but they need help, and they've been communicating consistently, um, and they let me know what their payment plan is. They let me know what that looks like, and that's something we're willing to work with and have that relationship with. Because that's where we, we know it's going to happen. So as we continue this thought process, um, and we think about these, these uh, phase one or scenario one, two, and three of what it looks like, and this is meant for that rebound curve. We go back to graph and that recapture period we, we mentioned before. This is that scenario. So in running these scenarios and these what if equations, um, what does this look like for you? You know, and, and you don't know the answer. We don't know the answer. But we're running the scenarios with our practices because each one of these scenarios are going to create a different impact to the business model and different things, different cash firms or cash surpluses um, that we have to have and that we will receive. But when you start thinking through this, again, that, that curve may be July, it may be June, in some cases it may be August. Uh, we've had some good success in the, the mid, you know, some of the areas that have opened up thus far. Um, and starting to see, you know, some the recapture period a little quicker than they thought. Now they're just monitoring the schedule three weeks out to see what does that look like, which is great. So I put in this, the strategic thing, decisions to think through at the moment. Um, you know, this is really built off of the budget. 
But I want you to think about the things that we should be doing now, you know, billing. A lot of our billing should have still been going on while we were closed, working through collections, working on getting our fee schedule set uh, for when we reopen, uh, working those credits, if you will, not to, you know, you have to, you're legally obligated to repay them, but certainly managing them to see if there's any treatment planning that can be done to match those credits up with outstanding AR, but just cleaning up all your fundamentals, getting your accounting set, getting your budget built, um, but then you start thinking about my scheduling, right? Are there things within our IT? I know Jim, Jim was speaking with me early in this session. They had users saying, well, we want, we're going to convert to CareStack. We're going to wait until later in the year. But now this is great. We're down. We can do some training. Um, now this allows us to implement some new systems and tools and technologies that we wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, so I know that's been a good opportunity. Same with us in the accounting world. People that are going to move to us this summer, like, hey, let's go ahead and move that forward so we're ready to reopen together. Right. Um, so that's been great conversations. Um, when you're putting together your plan, and I look at it as a 12 monthly plan because one of the things they're speaking about so often is the second wave. We don't know what it's going to look like, but every pandemic in the history of, of that we've tracked has always had a second wave. So if we have another one, are we prepared? Is there going to be a vaccine? We don't know. But again, we're, we got a cash flow plan beyond the next six weeks, the next nine weeks. We need to think 12 months forward to make sure we're in a good position, but make that a rolling 12 months. Once one month passes, add another month and keep going and keep going um, because it's really important to have that kind of handle on your business. And if you've never done that before, this is where Eddie and I really sell. And this is one of the things uh, that we do incredibly well. So I like to end and, and at least midway point end uh, with a call to action. Understand what practice changes implemented during the pandemic pandemic will remain constant in the future. There will be some things that come out of this, good or bad, that will always be here. Understand those things that are temporary or maybe temporary, but we're reassuring ourselves like one time deep, deep sterilization and then what's the sterilization process from this point forward. Um, you know, to Jim's point about what the you know waiting room looks like, I know our dentist isn't going to have one. You're going to sit out in your car, you're going to text them. Uh, let them know you're there and they will come get you and walk you back. And the same person that's getting you and walking you back is the same person treating you. Um, so there's less people touching you along the way and they'll keep less people in the hallway. So, you know, they have a flow and the patient experience and all that type of stuff that's going to be there. That experience, I imagine, may be here for a while. Um, they may bring a waiting room back in one day, but that may be here for a while. So which processes can be improved? As business owners, we've all sat back and said, man, if I just had more time to work on my business, this is what I would do differently. Or if I had a new software I wanted to implement, this is the time I want to do that. So think about those things that, again, even in the worst pandemic, there's always positives that can come out of it. So think about that. Understand your financial implications. I know we've touched on that uh, enough. Um, and then, of course, investing in your, in your structure. But lastly, you know, I always say build your team. Um, you know, build your team. Make sure you have all your advisors. And I know there's 20 other people I don't have on this graph um, that should be there and definitely need to think about with your procurement process, with your, your vendor relationships, IT, HR, all those other folks. Make sure you're communicating consistently through that process. But I try to get to the halfway point so we can hand it over to Dan, so it's not just me talking today. So, Dan, go ahead. And let me uh, hand over the screen, by the way. All right. Thank you, Mike. So, uh, so Mike's really and, and Eddie, they've they've laid a good foundation for us uh, to to get into the supply chain topic. And this may be a topic that many of you have not had to think a lot about. Uh, you know, many of our practices that uh, that we see as as clients before we start working with them, they are used to next day or or a day after delivery. They're used to order fill rates of almost 100%, um, and and they're used to a lot of selection, a lot of choice in terms of where they, where they procure their supplies from. Um, and, and there's new products coming onto the market, all, all of that. So we've, we've been living in a land of, of riches, right? So, so now we move into some uncharted water and the supply chain dimension of a dental practice takes on new urgency. And uh, it, in, in many ways, it becomes fundamental now to your very survival uh, because with, uh, with the recent guidance, uh, and, and recognizing that some of the guidance is uh, is based uh, is different um, uh, between the the OSHA, the ADA, the ADHA. Um, you know, this is a very dynamic, uh, changing, and complex situation that uh, that we all find ourselves in. 
Uh, but in order to, to survive and, and to thrive, we want to talk about several issues that you can just take, so, so several actions that you can take now to, to prepare yourself for not only an effective reopening, but a more effective uh, cost structure and process foundation going forward. Um, and and uh, that's what's exciting for, for us is we've, we've seen an opportunity in the, in the dental world uh, for quite some time to, uh, to retool how supply chains are managed. And this crisis right now may be exactly uh, the, the push that the industry needs. So, so let's, let's get into that. And, and before I do go too far, I want to say that today's discussion will not just focus on PPE and infection control products. Uh, the, the, the principles largely apply to, uh, to anything that you buy to support your practice. Not just goods, of course, but services as well. So uh, we like to think about uh, sort of spend management. Total outside goods and services spend can be managed with an effective uh, uh, supply chain or procurement process. So let's, uh, let's, let's get into this. And, and first, we're going to start off with some perspective about preparing your team. So now more than ever, I think the point I want to leave with you is that your team really expands to include your suppliers. And your suppliers are ideally strategic partners uh, of, of yours in reopening your practice, continuing to, to, uh, to have a thriving practice. And obviously, they're very dependent on you having a thriving practice as well. So it, it very much is a partnership. It's a collaboration. And it should be coordinated tightly. That's where we see the best overall value uh, from a, a, uh, you know, a supplier customer relationship comes about when you're able to work in coordinated partnership. And that's not something that, uh, uh, that you may be used to, to doing. So what does that, what does that mean? Well, we'd like to, we'd like to put forth uh, today that it's really a, it's a foundational process of, of any business to, uh, to understand who your strategic partners are. Mike talked about building a, a team. Um, you know, your, your suppliers are key in that. We want to make sure that um, we recognize, particularly now, that procurement is going to take more time. It is going to take more effort. We cannot let our procurement and supply chain activities simply run uh, as they have before on autopilot. Um, you know, we've spoken with people who take advantage of, for example, auto order programs with their suppliers where products just show up on a monthly schedule. Um, great for convenience, but in this time of uncertainty, do you really have the, the kind of predictable volume that you once did to make that program make sense for you? Um, do your suppliers have the predictable uh, in inventory that you need to make a program like that work? And I think the answer to that is, uh, both of those questions is no. So we can't, let, we can't let supply chain run on autopilot. We need to decide on roles and responsibility shifts that will allow you to uh, to stay on top of it like you've never uh, stayed on top of it before. And, and I would suggest that you have a captain of, of your supply chain or procurement uh, activities in the office so he or she can, can uh, deal with all the different details that you're going to have to stay on top of during this reopening and, and uh, phase and beyond. And when we say beyond, uh, you know, the, the experts are projecting that because of the spike in use of PPE being relatively permanent, uh, that we are going to a shortage, shortages of PPE and infection control products for quite some time. This is not going to be uh, uh, quite the same curve that, that Mike was showing in terms of, of a rebound on those particular products. Obviously, factories are, are being retooled. Companies are, are being born and reborn to, to respond to the demand, but it does take quite a bit of time to, um, to, to adjust. So we're going to be in a tight supply situation for many of these products for, for a while. So what are some actions that you can take? Um, one is it's time to have the tough conversations. And, and as, as, uh, as much as we all might like to avoid that, the tough conversations right now will really help ensure your survival. And, and that means, first of all, emphasizing with your supplier partners that um, you have continuity of PPE, continuity of infection control products. It is not, uh, it is, it is not likely that anyone will be able to provide you um, enough for your, for your own personal stockpile. Um, and, and so continuity of that is key, obviously, to, to running your practice. Now, many suppliers, of course, they, they've been in, in this mode for a while. Uh, we, we started seeing shortages of, of PPE reported uh, uh, even before COVID-19 was really all across the news. Uh, we, we started seeing 
shortages uh, in the U.S. Uh, in, in February and, and even into January. So now that we are in full-blown uh, uh, pandemic mode, many suppliers will have uh, hardship programs um, uh, where they will work with you, whether that's extending payment, uh, whether that is changing your credit, uh, 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 credit line, um, whatever their program is, make sure that you are aware of it and make sure that you are, are working closely with your supplier to take full advantage of that, of that program. And in, uh, in conjunction with, with that, and, and that's not a, it's, it's not enough to, to, to sort of defer payment. Um, we, we think you can go deeper with that, with that supplier uh, tough conversation and, and, and have that conversation around competitive pricing. So we, we, when we talk about supply chain, we talk about overall value. Um, we also talk about continuity. When we come to, to overall value, we want to make sure that we are um, taking advantage of our buying power to the fullest. And some of us um, perhaps uh, have changed our volumes over the years and our supplier pricing hasn't caught up with that. Maybe some of you have added uh, new practices, uh, new doctors to your practice. Now's the time to make sure that that supplier is able to extend to you the most favorable pricing that they have uh, and, and that uh, and that they continue to provide that pricing for the foreseeable future. Um, the, the margins uh, that they may have enjoyed pre-COVID-19, um, you know, everyone is, is feeling the crunch. So I will tell you that suppliers are much more interested in working with you at a reduced margin than they would be not working with you at all. So there's a win-win a, a component that's very important to work in partnership. And I'm not talking about, you know, beating someone up until they give up, uh, give up another 3%. This is a partnership conversation, but it is a conversation that many of us are, are not used to having. I think you'll find suppliers are pretty receptive um, to, to having those conversations, seeing what they can uh, what they can bring to the table. The last thing I want to mention real quickly is the favorable payment terms. So if you are paying your suppliers um, in 30 days, ask them if they can hold uh, hold your due date until 60 or 90 days. Some of you may be able to extend payment beyond that. Make sure that you um, explore the option to not use a credit card. If you're using a credit card with your supplier, uh, the supplier, of course, incurs fees every time you use a credit card. That, those fees go to the bank. If you can cut out those fees between the two of you, uh, there may be a win-win situation. So maybe you agree to pay your supplier in 60 days with a check instead of 30 days with a credit card, and you'll, come out, you'll both come out ahead. So explore those options with your supplier. Uh, the, the other item uh, here is, is uh, don't rely solely on the online tools. Things are so dynamic right now that the, uh, the websites that suppliers provide are oftentimes going to be inaccurate. Uh, they're going to certainly be lagging um, reality of what is available to ship and when it is available to ship. So don't be caught in over-reliance right now. Um, have, pick up the phone uh, and, and use your account managers to the fullest uh, of their capabilities because they have creative knowledge. Uh, they have creative solutions they can bring to the table that a, uh, a dot com site is, is not going to be able to provide, particularly at this, uh, at this juncture. We would recommend as well, develop multiple supplier relationships. If you have been the type of practice that's relied on a single supplier relationship and that supplier uh, has strict allocations in place for PPE, you may find yourself tapped out this is a time to cultivate old relationships or form new relationships uh, to, to, uh, to, to spread out your source of supply. It also helps on the competition. When the supplier knows that there are other options in your portfolio, uh, the, the, the pencils tend to be sharpened. So don't be afraid to, to cultivate uh, multiple supplier relationships during this time. And perhaps a, a, on the bit on the obvious side is you're going to need to accept uh, alternate specifications for products, particularly uh, considering PPE shortages. So be prepared to, uh, to work with your account managers on alternate products that may fit the bill uh, for, for your, your particular specialty. Hey, Dan, this is a question from the audience. I don't know if I, it's an appropriate time to interject, but do you mind if I bring yep. it up? Sure. Um, so the, this person is concerned about gray market creeping into the space, right? And, and you yep. mentioned, you just talked about alternate identifying products, alternate products, especially in the realm of PPE. I, I don't know if this is an area, and, and maybe it's more appropriate for Jeff too as well to comment on this, but how do the practices protect themselves in, their, in 
you know, related to knowing and validating a product and if it's, it's efficacy due to the fact that it might be, there's so much flooding the market right now from different sources and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. That's a relevant concern. And, and you know, we, we would advise using extreme caution when moving ahead with any new supplier uh, that is not known to, to you or, or that is new to the marketplace. Uh, the, the ADA has some, uh, some great guidelines on identifying counterfeit or fraud uh, suppliers, counterfeit products, um, and, and we can provide a, a link uh, to that to, to anyone that's interested, but it's on the ADA website uh, because this is a time uh, where new, uh, new sources of supply are entering the market, trying to capitalize on the, uh, on the high demand. Uh, so we would advise sticking with authorized suppliers um, you know, who have the expertise to evaluate um, potentially new, uh, new solutions to the marketplace so that you are not put in a position uh, to, to do that yourself. And certainly if you are in a tight spot where you have to accept uh, PPE from a, from a brand new source before committing too many dollars to that, um, you have the right to request a sample. And uh, I would advise that if it's a product you've never used before, uh, before committing to a, a large purchase. Thank you, Jeff. Do you want to weigh in here too as well? I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't, this might be appropriate for you as well. Sure. Sure, happy to. So uh, I think a couple of suggestions I would give to the audience. First is, you know, make sure that you're checking the FDA clearances of the various products. You know, news came out yesterday that the FDA slashed um, probably about three quarters of the list of manufacturers for the KN95 masks, which were an alternative to the N95s that were available. Um, so step one is, you know, do your due diligence, make sure you're finding out who the manufacturer is of the product that you're purchasing and make sure they're on the FDA's most current approved list. Um, and the second, you know, just broader feedback I would give is PPE is tight throughout the entire supply chain, throughout all industries, throughout the world right now. So, you know, like anything else, if you find something that feels too good to be true, right, from a source that you've never used before, that you haven't known before, and there's unlimited product availability at pricing that just seems, you know, so much head and shoulders bet, a better above whatever else is on the market, you know, use skepticism and, and be prepared to do some extra due diligence on those sources. Great, thank you. Sorry about that, Dan. I just, I didn't mean to interrupt your presentation. Fire away, please. Yeah, no, no worries. Thanks, uh, thanks for that perspective, Jeff. Uh, and and it, it really is, uh, it, it is important to remember that, uh, you know, suppliers are in this time of crisis with us. And, um, you know, they have, they have full-time teams dedicated to finding uh, and assuring continuity of supplies for their customers. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about that next. Actually, that's a good, good segue. And, and, and this is something that uh, may be a new concept for, for many of you on the call, but I'm going to talk about the very basics of supply chain planning. And, and what I mean by that is synchronizing your needs to your supplies or your supplies to your needs, uh, vice versa. So now more than ever, we need to look at um, what our true need uh, and anticipated volumes are and align that with the supplies that we have. Um, because of the shortages. So being able to, first of all, identify um, a, a forecast that is, that is reasonably accurate. Now, by, by reasonably accurate, and we talk about scenarios, Mike talked about scenarios. Scenarios are, are a great tool um, to, be, to be planning, um, but you're going to have to, to revisit those scenarios as, as, the, as the reality um, plays out. The first thing we would advise is a regular forecasting pace so that you are, um, you're again, not leaving things on overdrive or auto drive, but, but being able to look at this, say, on a weekly basis. And you're looking forward. Uh, many practices that we advise, they're, they're, they're used to looking at uh, the rear view mirror when it comes to production. So they might look at prior month's production, calculate a percentage of that, set a budget for supplies, and make their purchases for the, the upcoming month. Uh, that will not work in these days. Um, your, uh, your prior month production basically is, is not, uh, not going to reflect your, your current uh, and forward months pr uh, production now. So uh, understand, uh, understand that it will be different and take an active role. And then being visible to your account managers is, is just sort of a fundamental perspective here. Your account managers um, need to hear from you. Um, the more visible that you are to them, checking in with them, understanding the dynamics of the situation, the better um, uh, you, you know, your, your needs that will appear to them when unexpected supplies become available. 
the last thing that you want to be is is invisible to your uh, to your account manager where they're only hearing from you when you have a panicked uh, uh, order that needs to be placed. So there's a lot of different ways that that can uh, could, that can happen, but you don't want to be invisible at this at this particular juncture. Actions that you can take. First of all, we would say make sure that you identify your your critical items that uh, that you need to to see patients. That is going to vary, of course, on your specialty, um, but but have that have that list. That's what you're going to be monitoring and, and forecasting most tightly. In a weekly planning cadence, we would suggest um, taking the following steps. First of all, take a physical count. Now, if a physical count is, is, uh, is, is something that's difficult because of the arrangement of your supply closet, then take your critical items and put them all in one part of your, of your supply closet so that you can count them quickly and easily each, each week. Um, then you want to look at your, your upcoming procedures. And here's where your practice management solution can come in come into handy. Obviously, that's a dynamic situation as well. But looking forward, not backward, is key as you're, as you're opening up in stages and, and your, your volume is evolving. You're going to look at actual bookings. You're going to look at projected bookings. And we're recommending you look about eight weeks out. And the reason why we're looking eight weeks out is because a lot of back orders for PPE are eight weeks out right now. That may, uh, that may be reduced, but uh, uh, for now, that's a good, a good guideline. You're going to be staying in contact with your supplier on their delivery schedule as well as their allocations. So if you haven't heard the word allocation yet, um, it, it will become very familiar to you as you talk with your supplier. But understand how they reserve what products for, for you as a customer. What, what sort of bucket do you fall under? How many boxes of gloves and, and uh, cases of gowns, et cetera, can you, can you expect to procure on a weekly or monthly basis from them? You'll have this concept of, of safety stock, which Admittedly, it's going to be very tight in the early goings, but safety stock allows you to perhaps see a, a surge in patients or different types of procedures. If you can build up a supply uh, of safety stock, obviously not a bad idea right now. Uh, in case there may be another wave of, uh, of, of shortages, which we cannot rule out. And then you're going to take all these into consideration. You're going to place orders for, for wherever those gaps are staying closely aligned with your, uh, with your supplies uh, and it, with the available supplies that you have with those relationship suppliers. So suppliers are um, awash in back orders. I, I heard one major supplier, they have 25,000 back orders right now just for PPE. So you can imagine with that uh, number uh, of orders that they've got to have some algorithms to, to, to plow through that. And their back order situation is changing constantly as new supplies are found and, and supplies are, are shipped out. So staying aligned with each and every one of your back orders so that you know, is it still in queue? When will it be delivered? And to what uh, quantity will it be delivered? If I have a back order for 100 boxes of gloves and they're only going to be getting, able to give me 20 in the next uh, three weeks, I need to know that. And I need to be part of my, uh, my planning. Another major... Um, pain point uh, that, that you, you want to watch out for is the idea that your pricing may be, uh, may be accelerating through the roof on some of these products. So we have, hit, we have had reports that uh, uh, PPE is, uh, is running six to eight times uh, uh, as costly as it did pre-pandemic. The, uh, the suppliers are really struggling right now to fix a price uh, that, that they can sell uh, that PPE at because their manufacturers are passing along uh, weekly or even daily uh, cost increases. What, what you want to be assured of uh, from your supplier is if you place an order today, that they're going to honor the price today uh, that is reflected uh, either in a quote that you get from them or on their website or however you communicate with your uh, with your account manager, make sure you understand their policy, make sure that they are going to honor that price when they finally do ship. Because eight weeks from now, the PPE cost situation is probably going to be higher than it is right now. Um, so you want to make sure that you keep good documentation that you understand their policy on supporting a, uh, a certain price. Okay. And then place regular orders. The concept is, is this, um, base hits rather than home runs. You want to be in a position to, to place multiple small and regular orders with your suppliers. Uh, having multiple suppliers, again, is the best as a strategy. Uh, you won't get all of those, 
uh, but you will get some. And so rather than placing all of your eggs in, in one basket for a large order to be filled, uh, we would recommend spreading it, spreading it out a little bit and, and key is, is having it regular. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about lowering costs because obviously um, you're concerned ab about the financials of your practice um, and, and there's some process changes and improvements that uh, we believe you can make now as well as into the uh, uh, future to, to make your, your practice more effective long-term. And I, I, wanna, I wanna make sure that we, we cover this one theme well, and that is rigor in your spend like rigor in production. When you are producing, think about all the things that go into that and the rigor that you approach that part of your, of your livelihood um, uh, with. Obviously, you're understanding the reimbursement process from your, from your, uh, your patients as well as uh, third-party payers. You've negotiated, um, you've, you've, uh, you've, you've signed those contracts, you have a structured way that everything is, is done all the way through the, the end of the collection cycle. We need to approach our spend, our supply chain spend, with that same rigor. So we wanna have a strong process that is well documented, that is followed consistently, that includes uh, that sense of, of negotiation and, and, and uh, fixing the prices, uh, providing for an approval and review process before purchases are committed to, and then checking at the end of the cycle, did the supplier conform to those uh, ne negotiated prices that you agreed on? Okay. So there's gonna be a new set of upfront controls that, that, uh, that you have an opportunity to, to, uh, to implement. I was, I was speaking with a, uh, an oral surgeon recently. Uh, their staff was trying to be proactive and they placed uh, a $15,000 unexpected order. That's a big number. Uh, so you don't want to be surprised, uh, particularly when cash may be tight. You don't want to be surprised by orders being placed by your staff. So there's some upfront controls that can help with that. Don't forget about competing suppliers against one another. There's a variety of ways that that can be done. Uh, but generally, uh, you are the winner in a supplier competition. You are also advised to understand the market pricing, as it may have changed since the last time that you, uh, that you looked at it. So that's an important part of lowering costs in a very tangible way. And it's an important ongoing responsibility of, uh, of your supply chain captain. Hey, Dan, to interrupt here for a second, I just want to encourage people. I know it's Friday, everyone, and we had so many questions prior in the week. And, and we've got everyone here still on the program. So we've got eight or nine minutes left. And this is a great time um, to really pose your questions. So that way, when we, can when we conclude the presentation, we have a chance to adequately address them. So I'm a, a challenge to the audience. Please use your... I know people are, are passionate about these topics. Let's use the opportunity for these experts to get their perspectives on, on the areas of concern for you specifically. So thank you, Dan, back to you. Yep, yep, thanks, uh, lo thanks Jim. Looking forward to those, uh, those questions, folks. Um, you know, what, what's at stake here? Uh, one of the questions that need to be asked is, what can you really save um, with, with a, uh, a competition process? And, and our numbers, uh, when we do spend analyses for our for our clients, we're seeing anywhere between 12 and 20% savings on dental supplies uh, from, from the status quo. So there's, uh, there's quite a bit of, uh, of, of, of margin to be, uh, to be gained there and every dollar in a time like this really matters. Enforce a budget, whatever that budget is, uh, may need to change, but the budget should be, uh, should be reviewed before purchases are committed, not afterwards. So you don't wanna be surprised in a time like this. The last two points we'll make is, is tightening and putting a better structure around your receiving process and your payables process. By receiving, I mean when shipments arrive, you want to make sure that you're checking them over consistently and that you're documenting what has arrived, particularly on PPE, um, because that is critical to, to your forecast and to your, to your ability to serve patients. On the payable side, you want to make sure that you are comparing that invoice to the pricing that was guaranteed up front when you placed your order. Whatever method that you use to place your order, you need to compare that pricing to make sure that it's being honored on the invoice. Uh, many people, unfortunately, they sign off the invoice um, based on a ballpark. You know, hey, it looks about right. I would, I would tell you that the, that, is not, that is leaving uh, money on the table. So Dan, in your experience, like what's the diligence look like in the, in the dental space? I know you mentioned higher education in your background and I don't want to put you on the spot, but ballpark, what kind of diligence do you see in dental practices in that, in that activity? Yeah, most, most people in the dental world that we're experiencing are, are uh, checking over receipts uh, and kind of 
signing off on an invoice. And based on that sign off, the invoice is being paid. What they're not doing is comparing down uh, to the pricing level. So they're looking at quantities strictly, but they're not looking at the pricing. Was the pricing what you negotiated for? Was the pricing uh, that you were invoiced for what you ordered it at? Um, and just uh, invoice error rate, the industry standard for invo invoice errors is about 4%. Wow. So okay. 4% gain right there just by tightening up that payment process. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, let's move to, uh, yeah, the last slide here that, that I had, and, and that's, that's really around this, this idea of, uh, of protecting your supply. Um, so I, I hesitated almost to use the, the word protect, but, but then, you know, when you start to look at the situation, first of all, PPE is six to eight times more valuable than it ever has been before. Secondly, it's on the evening news. Everybody now knows, if you're watching the news, what an N95 mask is, right? Very different situation than what we found ourselves in in, in January and February. So you don't you don't want to uh, you don't want to lose sight of your precious supplies once once you're able to, uh, to 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 get a line on them. So first of all, that means um, protecting your your source of supply. So watching out for the fraud and the counterfeit uh, issues, as we spoke about earlier. Understanding the um, the changing financial assumptions um, that you may have around how much products will cost, how much of the supplies are, are going to run you for infection control and, and for PPE. There's a, uh, there's a great calculator from a, uh, an advisory firm called Five Lakes that uh, well, we can also send a, uh, a link to. It's a PPE cost and labor estimator for COVID-19. So it allows you to think through in a structured way how much extra cost are you going to incur because of the uh, infection control and, and personal protection protocols being put in place. Um, that by their estimate, they're looking at uh, six to ten percent overall cost increases. Uh, is what they're seeing. You need to run those numbers for your own practice and, and make sure that you understand your your margins. I also want to point out that you know, because it's a dynamic market, there are. Hey Dan, you've got about a two minute warning here, and then we're going to take a couple questions if that's okay. All right. Just to Very give good. You an update on time. Very good. So stay abreast of those new PPE uh, markets. Uh, I know in our state of Indiana, there's a. Uh, uh, government-sponsored PPE marketplace that has, uh, has emerged. You want to make sure that you understand your, your consumption and allocation and train your staff to, to follow those new procedures. And then you want to physically protect your PPE supplies. Um, as uncomfortable as this may sound, your patients, uh, your, your foot traffic, uh, even your staff um, you know, may fall into some, some uh, less than desirable habits and, and uh, some of those PPE supplies may, may, uh, may walk out the door because of how precious it is. So just, uh, just be cautious there, as you will be cautious with your new sources of supply. And monitor those, uh, those margins, because the assumptions that you may have had um, right now are, are going to be quite different in the, in the time of recovery, both, uh, both from a cost per procedure standpoint, as well as a number of procedures per hour. And I know Mike uh, touched on that earlier. All right, Jim, so I think, uh, I think we're ready to take some questions again. Yeah, sure. So um, for Mike and Eddie, you talk a little bit about how the PVP landscape has, you know, evolved. And I know you, no one has a crystal ball here, but what do you think is going to be, what can people expect on, the, on this forgiveness? If there's a timeline or kind of what you might see around the corner here in the, in the coming week or two? Yeah, um, what I would see, hopefully there's going to be guidance on, from the SBA on the forgiveness. Uh, banks, CPA firms, advisors are all waiting with bated breath for that. I've had a lot of questions, um, even some people I have to get back to from the, the, the session the last day. People are asking questions about, can I pay bonuses? Can I pay prepayments up to that 15800 um Fifty-four level, um, and the question, the 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 answer, it's the the legislation specifically states that it's costs incurred and payments made during the covered period. So what does that mean? It's very vague, so you could take your own meaning. So that's where the guidance comes in to give you a specificity as regards the process. Um, again, the banks are waiting on the guidance before they come up with the process. I imagine the process is going to be some sort of an application process similar to the underwriting of the loan. Major problem there is the banks don't have the bandwidth 
to um, to basically process the loans. Now, remind the forgiveness of it. Uh, I was talking to an ex-colleague just at the weekend on a social Zoom call, and he works with one of the big four accounting firms. One of the big banks here had hired a loan of staff accountants from the big four to actually process the loans. Uh, I hadn't known that before. They're, they're under severe pressure logistically. Wow from this. So do I think the forgiveness process, uh, is it going to start to hit the ground running on July 1? Absolutely not. I would, okay. I would probably say definitely not. Um, so how long does that go on? I, I, I don't know. And one other thing is that we did speak the last day about the, the additional uh, thing whereby the deferral of the employer's share of social security uh, they're saying that that's from March 27th through to the date of forgiveness of the PPP loan, if that's if you have a PPP loan. Well, then it's in the vested interests of the uh, dentist in this case or business owner to extend out that forgiveness date through the end of the year. So they get this elongated deferral period on the Social Security. So a lot of things are at play here. Uh, but I, I don't know what you think, Mike, but I can't see it being quick. Can you? No, I can't. I, I, I mean, the process was so rushed to get it going on the front end alone. They do have a little time to figure it out if the government gives them those parameters to figure it out and give them a little more timeline to do it. Otherwise, we may be rushed at the end, and just like we're seeing now, uh, where they're trying to go back and retroactive some of the things that they've already made statements on, i.e. the fact that the PPP forgiveness will be a tax credit grant free type deal. Uh, now the IRS coming out and saying, but you can't take the deductions for it, which then makes it a, a taxable event. So there's still a lot of infighting going on within the Congress on getting this executed properly. So, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Some good. Sorry, go ahead, Eddie. Yeah, that's a very good point, Mike. There's uh, you've got now the situation whereby Congress is fighting with the, uh, government bodies over what they meant in the first place so it's um it's a, a little bit of chaos out there in the legislative world and governmental world as well so and obviously we're we're all uh, uh waiting with bated breath as to what they decide thank you and dan to close us out someone asked you know what one or two pearls when it comes to procurement you know can these dental offices implement here in the, in the near future? What are like the one or two major takeaways? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say first and foremost is, is maintain those supplier relationships, stay visible with them. And secondly, it would be tighten up your, tighten up your processes. They're going to take more time, but now's a, now's a great time to invest the energy uh, in, in doing that. Uh, these processes are, are going to serve you well uh, short term and, and over the long term. Great. Thank you for your insight, guys. I want to be, I'll be mindful of the time here. You have Mike and it's too bad we don't have one slide with everyone's contact information. Uh, Mike and Eddie, their information's up right now. And, and, and Dan, if you want to fast forward and leave your info up um, too as well here for a moment to continue the conversation. Yep. So, thank you everyone well, for thank participating. You all for being here. Yeah. Thank Thanks you all for very much. Here. Yeah, really Dan, appreciate Eddie, it. It's our pleasure. Mike. Yeah, thank you. And just a quick reminder, the fourth of this four-part series will be next Thursday, hosted at the same time by Teresa Duncan and Lynn Leggett. And so you'll have that information from Darby if you've already registered for this website. So we'd love to see you back here as we conclude the series. And most importantly, stay safe and healthy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Appreciate it, guys. All right. Take All care. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.